Good afternoon, church family. Today is Tuesday, the 16th of February, and I'm glad that you've chosen this afternoon to spend time with me. Uh, I am looking forward to opening God's Word to us. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Uh, I'm going to ask the blessing on our time together, ask the Lord to bless it and to uh, open up our minds so that we can hear His Word and understand it, Um, and then also for the power to put it into practice. Uh, And then after I do that, we'll read 1 Corinthians 15, the first uh, 34 verses or so. 1 Corinthians 15 is a long chapter. Um, I'll put it into context a little bit from start to finish, but uh, I'm just going to read the first 34 verses, and then we'll walk through that together uh, today. We only have a few more uh, weeks together in 1 Corinthians, and so uh, I'm excited that we're coming to the conclusion of this wonderful book, and I thank you for sticking with me through all this time. I hope that it's encouraged you. I hope that you've seen things and perhaps a different perspective, or if not a different perspective, then you've seen things in a way that encourages you to continue to to live for the Lord. So let's do this. Let me pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. And then after I pray, we'll spend some time in the Word together. So bow with me, please. Lord, I'm grateful for the opportunity, the the equipment, uh, the know-how that uh, you've given us and, and others to Um, to be able to communicate your word across the miles. So, Lord, I pray that in these moments you would bless us, that you would give us grace. And, Lord, that we would uh, hear your word, that we would read your word. And, Lord, we would do so with understanding and that you would apply it to our lives. And, Lord, we'd be changed for having been in this moment. So, Lord, bless us now. Uh, Give us your grace. May we honor you with what we read, what we do, what we say Lord, I pray that I would speak well today and that you would guide my thoughts and my words. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is coming to the conclusion of this letter. And as he's approaching the conclusion, uh, he is still uh, talking about the, the problems in this Corinthian church. And he's, he's drawing, an attention, drawing attention to those things uh, that have um, that have become difficult, and so here in First Corinthians fifteen, um, he is going to address uh, the the reality of uh, bodily resurrection from the dead. But in doing so, he is he is doing it for a reason, and that is because what we believe, that is the the belief system, the worldview, if you will, but the belief system that's in our lives. It drives how we behave. And so throughout much of this uh, letter, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth about, um, about the way that they acted, the things that were going on within the congregation. Um, and, and I've told you since we've started that, uh, that our, what we believe really drives the way that we behave. Well, now Paul brings it in, this into focus in his letter that uh, what we believe drives how we behave. And wrong belief, that is, um, if we have a foundational worldview or a foundational belief system that is wrong or wrong-headed, um, it uh, will we'll end up doing things, at least for the wrong reason, but probably we'll be doing the wrong things. And so um, the, the converse of that is true. Right belief yields right actions. So if wrong belief leads to uh, bad actions, poor actions on our part, um, if, if wrong belief leads us to sin, then right belief leads us to behave rightly. And so Paul is going to address this concept of belief here um, in these first 34 uh, verses. You know, sometimes people will tell me as a preacher, preacher, just tell me how to act or tell me what to do. Just, just give me a list of things that I need to do and I'll do those and then everything will be okay. But that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about having a right belief in the Lord Jesus that then yields right actions. It's the belief that goes first, 
not the actions. And so we're going to see this here in these first 34, where it actually goes through the whole chapter, but I can only, I can only take these in bite-sized pieces. And so we'll look at this in the first 34 verses. So if you have God's Word, open it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me read these verses to you, and then we'll talk about them. I'll try to explain them uh, throughout. So let's do this. God's Word says this, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also re received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain." But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, your faith also is in vain." Or, or is vain, excuse me, your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming." Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected who put all things in subjection. He is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will those who do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily." If from human motives I fought with be wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Well, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. I'm going to stop there in verse 34, although it goes on to verse 58. Um, even as Paul walks through this discussion. Now, what you need to hear is that this is not a defense about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. This is not really, uh, the reason he's writing this is not to say once again that Jesus rose from the dead. This is a discussion to say that we will be raised from the dead. Uh, so he assumes, and we'll look at this in a second, but he assumes that if they're saved, they have to be saved because that by believing that Jesus rose again from the dead. So in their, in their belief, the, the, the problem here is not necessarily they don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. The problem is that they don't believe that humans will be raised from the dead. 
In fact, in verse 12, it sums up the whole problem of chapter 15. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And so that's the problem. That's what he's dealing with throughout chapter 15. And so I want to just show you some things in these first 34 verses as we look at what I've entitled the resurrection of the dead, um, part one. So, uh, first, notice the historical foundation for our beliefs. And I, I want you to underline that. I've been doing a lot of studying, getting ready for uh, what I've entitled Old Testament Survey, which is going to start at the beginning of March. I've been doing a lot of reading about proofs, about evidence, and about historical facts. And I want you to understand that based on the way that anything is, uh, is considered a fact, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is an historical fact. And so look at the historical foundations of our beliefs, verses 1 to 11. Uh, the first thing we see is that the gospel is the cornerstone for all of our beliefs and action. So everything that we do as a, as a believer, every way that we interact with others, everything that we do at church, everything that we would say that is a part of our life, all of that is built on the reality of the gospel. And so Paul starts by saying, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. So the gospel is the cornerstone for all of our beliefs and action. Uh, the mechanics of the gospel are laid out here for us. And I want you to hear first the mechanics of the gospel. How does the gospel work? Well, we see it's through proclamation, through re receiving it or believing it. Both of those, I think, are mean the, the same thing here, receiving and believing, and trusting in it. He says, I, I want to make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, that it was proclaimed. And, and by the way, just so you know, I'll, I'll give this away. He gets to it in a second. The gospel is uh, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. And so that's the gospel. Um, it's the power of God unto salvation, the Jew first and also to the Gentile for all who believe. And so notice that the way that the gospel works, though, is it must be proclaimed. Paul says, which I preached to you. And so the gospel has to be announced. It has to be proclaimed. Some of you may wonder, I've had people ask me this question before, Pastor, why do you uh, say the gospel in exactly the same way every time we get together, every time it's in, either on video or in the worship service or when I, uh, when I speak in a Sunday school class or just whenever, why do you always say it exactly the same way? Because I believe that we have to preach Christ crucified and resurrected according to the scriptures for our sins, that Jesus died for our sins because we are sinners. Jesus died for us. He paid for our sins. The reason why I believe that is because the way that the gospel works is it has to be announced. It's not good enough to say, come to Jesus. I mean, we ought to call people to Jesus, but you have to know why you're coming to Jesus. Why do we need the gospel? Because we're sinners. Because the wages of sin is death. Because Jesus lived a perfect life and died a substitutionary death for our sins according to the scriptures. So the reason why I say it the same way all the time is because it's the way the gospel works. We must announce the gospel. I can't just say to people, look, y'all got to be saved. I've got to tell them on what grounds they're being saved. The gospel works by saying Jesus died for us and rose again. I'm preaching through the book of Acts on Sunday morning. If you look at the sermons that are preached from the book of Acts, they say, you sinned, you put Jesus to death, but God raised him from the dead, that he died in our place. Those things, you see those things. And so w w the gospel, the mechanics of the gospel are proclamation and then receive and believe. He said, which I preach to you, which you also you received in which also, you stand. So the reception is a belief. They received it, 
And then they continue to trust in it. They, they stand in it. Um, uh, lots of, I, I've heard it said this, and I, I don't mean to quibble with other preachers or to say what they say is wrong or anything. That's not why I'm telling you this. But I, I have heard preachers say that if you, you know, once you're saved, you need to write the, uh, write the date of your salvation down in your Bible. And if ever, you're, if ever you doubt your salvation, you go back and you look at that date. Well, I want you to understand that there is some merit in saying that. Basically, they're saying, remember the day that you repented of your sins and trusted Christ. And that's good. But I want you to understand that the biblical um, definition of faith is present tense. You are believing right now in which you stand right now. And so if someone comes to me and says, Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved, uh, my question to them is, have you ever repented of your sins and trusted Christ? And they say, well, yeah, I think so. And then I'll say, well, are you trusting him right now? Because that's really the answer. Is your only hope of salvation putting your faith in what Jesus has done? If the answer is yes, then that's all you can, I mean, that's it. That, that's, that is salvation, trusting Jesus to make you right with God. If you're looking back in the past and not standing there now, um, that, that's a shaky surface. Um, the, the only thing we can, the only thing we can really hope in is: Are we putting our faith in Jesus now? And so that's what he says. And, and in fact, he says, "By which you're saved." That is, this gospel preached to you, received by you, or preached to you, received by you, in which you're standing, trusting in right now. By which you're saved. That's your salvation. And then he says, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you. And so uh, th this idea is grasping this gospel message that Jesus died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again. So uh, the belief of this gospel is our salvation. This gospel is the cornerstone of all our beliefs and actions. This is it. There's nothing else. This is the, the hope of that were made right with God. You say, well, what about all the rules, all the laws? Well, those initially show us our need for a Savior because we can't keep the laws or the rules. We fail them every time. In fact, to fail one is to fail them all. And, and so Jesus died for us. He kept them all. He died for us and rose again. So the way that we're reconciled to God, even though we're lawbreakers, is to put our faith in Jesus, who is the only law keeper, and then, who died for us, paid our atoning sacrifice for us, rose again from the dead. We put our faith in him, and therefore we don't need to keep the law. He did it. We trust him. But then, the rest of our lives, which is really the rest of this chapter as we look at it, uh, the, uh, our hope in living a life worth living is based on this belief that Jesus lived for us, died for us, rose again, made us right with God. Therefore, I don't have to keep the law to be right with God. So why do I follow the commandments? It's because I love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so, you know, we love God, we love others, we make disciples because we love Jesus, because we're right with God in him. So the gospel is the cornerstone for all our beliefs and actions. The facts of the gospel are historical facts. He, he picks up in verse 3 and goes on through verse 8, and he says, I delivered for you as of first importance what I also received. So the first thing I want you to see is this reality of the gospel that Jesus died for us, was buried and rose again, that truth, that, that, that statement, Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, he was buried and he rose again according to the Scriptures, that truth is the most important teaching that we have. It is the foundation for everything. That historical reality is the most important truth of our faith. Now, I know all truth is God's truth, and I know all truth is important because truth is truth. But what I want you to see is that this truth is the bedrock. It's the foundation. It's the uh, unshakable um, strength of what we believe. And the gospel is defined as a historic reality. Jesus did die. He was buried. And he did rise again. That is an historical truth. It happened in history. 
It was an event that, uh, that is, is as historical as Washington crossing the Delaware or as um, the, the, uh, the Challenger, the space shuttle blowing up in 1986. Those, those things are reality. They're facts. And just because we don't have a picture uh, taken by a Polaroid that we can publish of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection doesn't mean it didn't happen. It is truth. It is history. So the gospel is defined as an historic reality, and eyewitnesses could be raised to testify to that event. Um, In fact, Paul mentions them. He says, he appeared to Cephas. This is after Jesus' resurrection. He appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, the rest of these disciples, After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. So he showed up at a revival meeting, most of whom remain until now. So he's like, go talk to those folks. They're around us. When Paul wrote this, they were still alive. He's saying, go ask them. They saw Jesus after he rose again from the dead. By the way, that's the importance of of, of Paul mentioning that he was buried that he's saying Jesus really was dead. If you hear me say it, sometimes I'll say he was graveyard dead. That's not trying to be flippant or trying to um, make light of what Jesus, what Jesus did. What I'm, I'm trying to put it in our vernacular about when we said somebody's really dead, you can say he was dead as a doornail. And, and it's not making light of Jesus' death. In fact, it's just testifying to the fact that he really was dead. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. This wasn't some kind of, uh, of magic thing, supernatural thing that God did. He was alive, as, as much alive as I am, as physical as I am. And then he died, and they put him in a tomb because he was really dead. And then he rose again from the dead, and he was really alive after he was really dead. So that this was a reality, a real thing. And if you don't believe it, go ask these 500 and some people that, that he showed himself to. Because some of them are still alive. Go ask them. So eyewitnesses could be raised that would testify to Jesus' resurrection. Those are verses uh, four, I mean, uh, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. He appeared to James, that is Jesus' brother, and then all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul says, I even saw him. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that saw, Paul saw him twice, or in two, two separate uh, 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 events. I believe that Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, and it wasn't just a vision of Jesus, but he saw Jesus uh, alive after his death. And then I believe that when Paul was in Arabia, Paul was in the desert, I believe Jesus himself taught him uh, in the flesh. Now, it's... Um, anyway, that's, that's what I believe. And so, I, so Paul says, I saw him, even though I persecuted the church, I didn't deserve to see him, yet I still saw him. And so Paul says, not only are all those people eyewitnesses, but I'm an eyewitness as well. And then um, he, he sums this section up in verses 9 to 11 by saying that the, the, the acceptance, the appropriation of the gospel, that is the incorporation of the gospel into my life, the way that I own the gospel, is that I believe it. I, I, I believe that Jesus did die for me, that he was buried because he was really dead, and then the Father, accepting his sacrifice, raised him from the dead. And so because I believe that, that gospel then comes into my life. And so Paul believed it, even though he didn't deserve it. Uh, I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle, verse 9, because I persecuted the church of God. But, verse 10, by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. Uh, And so I believed it, I've been changed, I'm a different person, even though I was a murderer, even though I was hated God's church, even then Christ saved me based on the gospel. I believed it, even though I didn't deserve it. And then my actions were changed by it. So I went from persecuting God's church to now I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. So God changed my life because I believed the gospel, and now I became one of the the leaders of this movement based on God's grace working through me because I believed it. So Paul's actions were changed by his belief. And even the Corinthians heard it, and believed it. And he says, um, 
uh, verse 11, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So he says, if, if you're saved, Corinthians, if, if you have a right relationship with God, it's because you believed that Jesus lived, he died, and that he rose again. Now remember, from the very beginning, I said that's not the point of this. The point of this passage is not to say that Jesus uh, had risen from the dead, but the point of this passage is to say that we are going to rise from the dead, that there is a resurrection of humanity. That's the purpose of all this. So what Paul has just done in these first 11 verses is he's laid this foundation by saying, if you're right with God, you've already had to believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. It's the foundation of our belief. If you don't believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, you're not saved. In fact, in Romans, Paul says that if, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You have to believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus in order to be right with God. It's just, it's, it is the gospel. It's, it's what you have to believe. And so what he's saying is, you've already believed, if you've believed, you've already believed this. And so he's, he's, he's brought up this to dismiss it, saying you've already believed that Jesus rose again from the dead. Now, therefore, I'm going to show you how that makes a difference in your life. What does it mean to believe that? So the second thing that we see, picking up in verse 12, are the foolish consequences of wrong belief. So if, if you believe incorrectly, then what does that lead to in your life? And so let me just read these verses for you again, starting verse 12. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, he's, that's, that's the gospel. The gospel has to be preached. We're preaching the gospel that Christ was raised from the dead. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, so what he's saying is, some of you in this church at Corinth are saying there's no resurrection of the dead from the dead of, of the rest of us. That's, that's kind of what he's implying. That there's no resurrection of the dead from, uh, of, of human, humanity. That is, to die is to die. Um, and so this is kind of the heart of the matter. Some Corinthians did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. You say, why did they, why did they struggle with this? Well, Greek thought, and they were all Greeks, Greek thought held that there was a complete separation, distinction between spirit and body. So much so that some of the people that Paul ran into believed that as long as they were right with God in their spirit, they could do whatever they wanted to with their bodies because the bodies were going to die and they were going to be put aside, but their spirit would live forever. And so I want you to understand that if you believe that, if you believe that your body dies and decomposes and, and there's nothing left of it ever, then you don't really believe the gospel because the gospel holds out that there is the resurrection of the dead. That's, what, that's, that's the whole implication here. So Greeks believed there was a distinction between spirit and body. What Paul is saying is that there's not that distinction because even though to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, my body is put in the grave, but there is coming a day, and that's what he's going to get to here, there is coming a day when our bodies are going to come out of the ground, reunite with our spirit, we're going to be forever with Christ, and our bodies will be forever like Christ's body. So this is the future for us. So Greek thought held to a complete separation. It's not that they didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in a physical renewing of the body that would extend forever. And so he's not saying that the Greeks didn't believe in life after death. What he was saying was, you don't think that your bodies are going to come back from the dead. Now listen, I, I'm going to give it all away right here. That was the problem. Because they didn't believe that their bodies were going to come back from the dead, they thought that they could do whatever they wanted with their bodies, and it didn't matter in their Christian walk. Their wrong belief led to wrong actions. And what Paul is doing is he's trying to correct their belief so it become right belief, so that their actions would become right actions. So, friends, it absolutely matters what we believe. It's why when somebody, 
in a conversation with me, I, I make sure I clarify what the truth is before we talk about what, how, they're, they're, how they act. Because we, what you believe absolutely impacts how you act. And we'll see that in just a minute. So, the heart of the matter, some Corinthians did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so, because of that, Paul shows them the error of that wrong belief or the consequences of this wrong belief. Uh, if there is no resurrection of the dead, verse 13, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So here's what he says. The extended argument, if there is no resurrection from the dead, let me, let me wrap up, go back around and tell you what they're believing. There are some in the church at Corinth who, who say they believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. They believe the gospel, and yet they don't believe that there's any resurrection from the dead. So this is what Paul says. If that's true, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if your body is not going to come out of the grave, then Jesus wasn't raised. Because if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Jesus came back from the dead. Because Jesus is more than human, but he also is completely human. He's not less than human. Jesus is completely human. He's completely God, completely human. Because he's completely human, when he died, he was died like a human dies. And then he came back from the dead like a human comes back from the dead. But if there is no reality of humans coming back from the dead, then Jesus wasn't raised. And if Jesus wasn't raised, the preaching of the gospel and the believing of the gospel are a waste of time. He says, if Christ has not been raised, verse 14, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So believing, remember this, we're talking about the gospel now. This is the heart of the gospel. This is why the resurrection of the dead is a gospel issue. Preaching and believing are a waste of time. Those witnesses who say that Jesus was raised, remember I said this is a historical event. Witnesses said that they saw Jesus. If, if there is no resurrection of the dead, those witnesses are liars. Those who say they saw Jesus. So Paul and Peter and James and John and all the rest of the 500, they're all liars if Jesus wasn't raised. And so, and, oh, by the way, if there isn't the resurrection of the dead, no one can be saved. He says, if Christ has not been raised, this is verse 17, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. So friends, the great hope of the gospel when we put our faith in Jesus is that our sins are forgiven, they're removed from us, and we're right with God. He says if Jesus didn't come back from the dead, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if humans don't live again, if our bodies don't come back from the grave, then we're still in our sins, which means we're not reconciled with God. It means everything that we're doing is a waste of time. No one can be saved, and if no one can be saved, the dead are gone forever. So those who, uh, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, verse 18, they're perished. So there is no hope for a future. There's no hope for heaven. Uh, so what he's saying is, you said there's hope. Uh, you, you said that as, a, as Greek think, your spirits go to be with the Lord, your body's decomposed. But he says, look, if Jesus didn't come back from the dead, not even your spirits can go be with God because you're still a sinner. Those who are perished are still gone. Everything that you say you believe is turned upside down because you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And if all of this is true, if Jesus wasn't raised, if our preaching and believing are a waste of time, if those witnesses who said that Jesus was raised are liars, if no one can be saved, if the dead are gone forever, then we have wasted our lives. He finishes this up in verse 19. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. We've wasted our lives if there's no hope for the future. 
And so this is, this, these are the consequences of wrong belief. If you believe wrong, you're wasting your time. You're not, <laughs> you're not saved in this case. If you don't believe there's a resurrection of the dead, you're not saved. You're wasting your time. So the third thing I want you to see is, first, I showed you the historical foundation for our beliefs. The second, I showed you the foolish consequences of wrong belief. Now I want you to see the consequences of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. What about this right belief? Look at verses 20 to 28. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each is in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ said it's coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all and in all. By the way, the, that uh, it's difficult wording a little bit. Basically what he says is once Jesus puts everything in subject to him, once Jesus is Lord of all, he will then turn and give it all to God the Father. Uh, what Paul doesn't want you to think is that, um, is that the Son is now... Uh, over the father, he's kind of subjected the father to himself. That's not what happened. The, the father is over all. The son willingly, even though he's equal with the father in all points, there's equal in power, equal in essence, equal in knowledge, all those things, they're, they're equal, yet the son chooses to subordinate, subordinate himself to the father with all of us who belong to him. So that's that's that picture. That's why it's so... Um, strangely worded, but Paul is just saying, even though everything is put in subject to Jesus, Jesus then turns and gives it all to the Father to his glory. So the, we see the consequences of Jesus' resurrection. The historical fact clearly stated, Christ has been raised from the dead. It was true. It was based on eyewitnesses. That's verse 20. But now Christ has been raised. So all of that rhetorical um, argument that he used uh, from verses 12 to 19, he sets aside by saying, but Christ really has been raised. Therefore, it was true. It was based on eyewitnesses. Second, Jesus' resurrection is the promise and hope of our resurrection. So um, if you believe the gospel, then you have to believe in the resurrection from the dead, and that gives us promise and hope. The promise is this, that he was the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits of those who are asleep. If there are first fruits, there have to be second, third, fourth, fifth fruits. There have to be fruits that follow. That's, that's this designator. So basically he says Jesus was the first fruits from the dead. He's the, he's the, he's the first of many. That's what he's saying. He's, he's the leader of many. In fact, the way that I've called it is he is the resurrection head. So Jesus rose again from the dead in our place, um, just like he died in our place. Uh, he made this decision on our behalf. He, he triumphed for us. And so when we're in him, we all receive all the things that he earned. So um, we'll receive resurrection from the dead, just like Jesus got resurrection from the dead. That's what he's arguing. Um, he's the first fruit. He's the resurrection head. And you say, why, why are you allowed to say that? Well, he says it in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. This word head can also mean representative. Adam sinned, and all of us sinned too. Adam died, and all of us died too. Adam acted as our representative when he sinned in the garden. He acted on our behalf. Um, he was our human head. Um, the Bible says, in Adam all have sinned, and Adam all have died. That's what it says here. In, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So Adam was our sinful head. We, we get sin and death because of Adam. Um, by the way, let me just 
let me just take away some some people hear this they're like oh my goodness that's just crazy let me just tell you what this means adam made a decision on behalf of all of his um successors all of his family all of us adam made that decision but lest you think that it's unfair of us to be judged by adam we inherited his sin nature, but let me just assure you that at your very first opportune time, you sinned against God, I sinned against God as well. So it's not just Adam's condemnation, although we did inherit it. It's not just Adam's condemnation, it's also our own. We sin too. So you can't just say, well, it's Adam's fault because you and I have sinned. Adam was our sinful head, but Christ is our righteous head. In Christ, we get both righteousness, that is, we're made right with God, we get new life in Christ, but we also get resurrection in Christ. So we get resurrection from the dead. This is our hope based on Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. This isn't just spiritually made alive. This is also physically made alive. We're going to rise again from the dead in Christ. So Christ is our righteous head, and all of this is going to happen in a timely order. He says, verse 23, each in his own order. Christ came first. He was the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom. So when Jesus comes again, all of us, um, both dead in Christ and also those alive in Christ, we're all going to be made alive. So if you're alive when Jesus returns, you're still going to be given a resurrected body. You're going to be made new, as if you died and rose again. If you've died with Jesus, you're, you've put your faith in Christ, you've died now, your body's in the tomb, or, or cremated, or whatever, lost at sea, whatever, your spirits with the Lord. When Jesus returns, your body is going to come back from the sea, put back together from the ashes, or come back from the grave, and your body and your spirit are going to be made one. Your body is going to be made new again, and, uh, and, and you're going to be completely different. And by the way, this newness means we're going, to, we're going to have a physical body, but it's going to be a new kind of physical body. It's not going to be the same as we have right now, but that'll be next week that we talk about it, maybe not next week that it happens. <laughs> but uh, all of this is in, in a timely order. Christ, then those who belong to him by faith that is coming, and then the end of death itself, um, that's the final enemy that Jesus is going to destroy, the, the enemy of death. And so it's in him that complete reconciliation is accomplished. The reconciliation of our spirits, but also reconciliation of our flesh. In fact, I would just suggest to you that we are not meant to exist um, divided. So our spirit and our body aren't meant to exist apart. So final reconciliation of all things is us put back together in the way that we are supposed to exist, body and spirit, all one, in, in, as one human, one person, and it's in that oneness that we'll live for all eternity. In the intermediate state, that is between now and Jesus' coming, um, we'll exist as spirits in heaven, but that's not our final destiny. Our final destiny is to be put back together, renewed body, saved spirit, put back together for all of time. So that's, that's the hope of the Christian. So let's look at, we'll just finish up with the next steps of right belief. Because these things are true, because... Um, all things are then put back in subjection. Jesus beats death. He puts us all back together and then turns us all over to the Lord in him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all and in all. Everything put back together, all of this. All right, then, how, what should happen now? With all that being true, with that being the hope of our belief, what is our future? How do we live? What are the next steps of our right belief? We see these in verses 29 to 34. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If, they, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. 
If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought. Stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Let me just show you three things. First, religion is worthless if there is no resurrection from the dead. He kind of goes back to that in verses 29, 30, 31, and 32. Uh, he gives two examples. The first is the practice of baptism. Now, don't, don't, don't get confused. When Paul speaks of the, of the baptism for the dead, he's not saying that we ought to baptize for the dead. What he's saying is, why do some people, notice he uses the word they, it's kind of like outsiders. He said, otherwise, why do they baptize for the dead? He's not speaking of the practice of the church, but what he is saying is, those who do baptize for the dead, they believe that there's something future. They believe that there's something else out there for the body. So what he's saying is our religious activities aren't worth anything if there's not a resurrection from the dead. He moves on from baptism, that's the first example, and he goes to the second example, that of suffering, that of giving yourself up physically for the sake of Christ. He's speaking specifically of himself, why are we also in danger every hour? He's, he speaks that he dies daily, he counts himself dead all the time. Why can he do that? Because he has hope for the future. He believes that he's going to rise again in the future. If from human motives I fought to, with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He says, I ought not to be in danger. I ought to live an easy life if my body is not going to rise again from the dead. If, if this is all there is, if there's nothing else, then why live for Jesus? So that's his argument. So he, then he says, he gives two specific statements to us, one in verse 33 and one in verse 34. They are this. First, do not be deceived. That's the first statement. So how do we live? The next steps of right belief, it is we guard ourselves from wrong belief. Do not be deceived. It matters who you spend time with. That's what he says. Do not be deceived. deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So it matters who you hang out with. You can't just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. You must live rightly. Why? Because this is true, because our bodies are going to come back from the dead. So specifically, if, if you hang out with folks who don't believe in a bodily resurrection, you're going to become one of those folks who doesn't believe in bodily resurrection. So specifically, he's speaking about that. Generally, though, he's, this is a general truth. All of our behaviors will be affected by spending time with those who sin. And he says, so don't be deceived. There is a future for your body. It does matter how you live your life here. Therefore, live it well. Don't be deceived. The second statement he says is, sober up and stop sinning. Don't be drunk. He says there in verse 34, become sober-minded. Now, this doesn't literally, well, it, it, it does include literal drunkenness. So it, it does say don't be drunk, but that's not really what it means. It means sober up from being drunk by thinking that there's no future for our bodies. Think soberly and stop sinning. That means that if you believe in the resurrection of the dead, that your body is going to come back out of the grave, that you're going to live forever as, a, as you were created to be in relationship with God in a, in a renewed um, uh, glorified body, if that's the way you're going to spend all eternity, then stop sinning today. And when Paul says this, he means everything that he said to the Corinthians up to this point. Don't be divided. Don't be in sexual immorality. Don't be usurping the authority of others. Don't be prideful in the way that you exercise your spiritual gifts. All of this stuff needs to be subjected to the Lord because what we do in this life really does matter. So sober up and stop sinning. Bad belief is akin to being drunk. So sober up. And some of the members of the Corinthian church didn't have any knowledge of God. Here's the, here's the real problem with this, this drunken thinking, this bad thinking 
The real problem is if you're thinking wrongly, you don't have knowledge of God. So let me, let me draw this all full circle and try to wrap this up right here. If you don't believe that there's a bodily resurrection from the dead, you don't know God. That's what he's saying. You, you have no knowledge of God. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. It's a shame for people to be a part of the covenant community. We call it a church. To be a part of the new covenant, be a part of people who believe in Christ and not realize the implications of what it means to believe the gospel. And so if you don't believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, if you don't believe that, that you're going to rise again from the dead, you don't have knowledge of God. You don't understand what all of this is about. And so let me just wrap this up. I'll, I'll get back to this next week as the Lord allows. But let me just say this. In order to be right with God, you have to believe that Jesus, the second per person of the Godhead, eternal Son of God, came and became a human. So God became flesh. The God-man lived a perfect life. You and I have sinned, but he lived it perfectly. Then he stepped into your place and mine and paid for our sin debt and rose again from the dead. Because of what Jesus did, his perfect life, his atoning death, his resurrection from the dead, because of that, you and I can be made new. He fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf. So just like Adam sinned and then we inherited all the, all the problems of that sin, so Jesus was righteous. And in Christ, we can inherit all of the rewards, all of the privileges of his righteousness. He died for us, putting us to death. The Bible says wages of sin is death. If we, by faith, claim Jesus' death on our behalf, death has come to us, we've received it. And then he rose again to new life. His resurrection means we're going to be raised. And in some ways, we're already raised to that new life. But friends, it's coming in a literal, physical way when we come out of the grave on that day. The only way to be right with God is to put your faith in Jesus who lived and died and rose again. That belief that Jesus lived and died and rose again, which makes us right with God, then lives itself out in all of our activities. When we come to grips with this reality that we will live forever, then it causes us to desire to live rightly now and to be ministers of reconciliation to all those who are around us. For those of you who are listening to this and may not, and may not have ever come to a saving knowledge, putting your faith in Jesus who lived and died and rose again, then I want to encourage you, today you can trust Christ. Today's the day. You hear your need for a Savior, run to Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus who lived and died and rose again, knowing that when you put your faith in Christ, you'll be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For those of us who belong to Jesus, our desire ought to be right belief, that we order our lives in such a way that we seek to know him so that we won't be ashamed, that we would really know the Lord. And in knowing the Lord, we would serve him. And that's where right action comes in. All of these other things follow right beliefs. So friends... Run to Jesus. Trust Jesus who lives forever. And know that there's coming a day when we'll live forever too. What a great and glorious hope that we can live forever in Jesus. Friends, I love you. I'm glad to be able to be your pastor, to speak with you, to spend time with you. I hope that, uh, I hope that you know the Lord. I hope you're walking with the Lord. And if you need to know what to do, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And second... Be sober-minded and stop sinning. Let's follow Jesus together until he comes. God bless you. Have a great week.